was 16 pages long and it was called Flesh-Eating Warriors of the Forbidden City. And because French was my first language and I didn't learn English until I went to school, I do tend occasionally to lapse into French when I'm very tired, very drunk, or thinking about something else. And so if that happens, that's probably why. <laughs> it also means that I had a kind of insight into two very different cultures from an early age. And it got me thinking about what makes people belong and what makes them different. And I think that informed a lot of my writing because uh, many of my characters are people who, for one reason or another, are different and don't belong and therefore make a difference by not quite belonging because they have an outsider's view. And I think that must have come to me from, from quite early, from, from being in Barnsley, but in a French family. Did you find uh, you had any reaction from having a French mother and speaking French when you went to school? Oh yes, uh, some people were just very curious and they just wanted me to speak French all the time like it was some kind of party trick. <laughs> and uh, they particularly wanted, particularly they wanted to learn swear words. Uh, so Barnsley infant schools were filled with little, little people going around swearing at each other in French. I get very attached to characters and when I'm writing a story I usually feel instinctively whether or not I am finished with those characters or whether they're finished with me or whether there is more. With Fian and Anouk, I always thought there was more, but I wasn't necessarily <laughs> sure whether I would know what happened to them, whether I would ever find them again, and also I was slightly afraid of being stuck in that kind of village forever. If I wrote about it for too much, then my publishers would want me to stay there, and it would end up being like sort of midsummer murders with French <laughs> loaves, and I would never, never get out. And so I deliberately didn't write about them for a long time. Boy. It was a difficult book for me to write in the sense that it was an emotionally difficult place to be. I was writing about people who were difficult to like, difficult to understand, people who didn't really understand themselves and, um, and who were therefore quite unreliable narrators and whose story is quite complicated. It's a story that you have to work at. I did enjoy it though. I think in terms of achievement, I actually think that Blue Eyed Boy is probably the best thing that I've written. It won't be the most popular thing that I've written or, or the most accessible, but I think in terms of actual writing, it, it's probably about as far as I've pushed it so far. Um, in terms of actually having fun, um, my Rune Marks books were by far the most fun that I've ever had. They were a sort of enormous romp and pillow fight of a, a, a write, and, and partly it was because I wrote it uh, to please my daughter. Maddie is not all that different from other heroines that I've written that are facing a kind of big, patriarchal, faceless, administrative enemy. In Chocolat, it was the Catholic Church. In Holy Fools, it was also the Catholic Church. In Gentlemen and Players, it was a disguised version of grammar schools, living or dead, which the book doesn't resemble by a single iota. Um, in Maddie's world, it is a new religion called the Order which is at the same time patriarchal and invasive and which has made it its mission to make everything orderly and that means wiping out chaos, magic, stories, even dreams are looked down upon with some suspicion in Maddie's world because who knows, you have dreams, you might get ideas, if you have ideas anything could happen. I've tried to make my characters as accessible as possible, as, as understandable as possible. And actually, I think we all understand what it's like to feel excluded. We all understand what it's like to be gossiped about. We all understand the need to belong to a group. Um, and that's really what Rune Marks is about. That's what Maddie is about, her, her need to find out who she belongs to and what her real family is. Because children are very inspirational. And they have a constant capacity to surprise and to make you see the world in a slightly different way. And I do like that. I am not sure whether temperamentally I am fitted for the kind of writing that starts exactly at 9 o'clock and is punctuated by regular coffee breaks and the clocking in of the muse at a regular hour. Um, I don't think I have a muse. I don't think I was issued with one. They didn't have them in Barnsley. <laughs> I try to write something else. If I find that I'm blocked on one piece of work, I will write something else. Whether it's a short story, whether it's a chapter of another book, 
Writer's block, as far as I experience it, is not the inability to put words onto a page. It's the inability to continue a story in a certain way or get ideas or this kind of thing. And usually I find that the best way to get rid of it is to, to forget about writing and to go off and do something else. My tastes are very broad. So I will read pretty much anything by Ian Banks if it comes out, pretty much anything by Haruki Murakami, and pretty much anything by Stephen King. Beyond that, I read a lot of old favourites. I'm a serial re-reader of books. And the books that I loved when I was a child, most of them I still love now. And so I still love people like Ray Bradbury, who I think is one of the great underrated heroes of the 20th century, and I still love his work. Did the Kenneth Branagh film of Thor, which was based on the Marvel superheroes take on the Norse legends, have any kind of influence on your new Runelite book? Because that really. came out about it, six months ago. Yes, but it was written like four years ago, so... No, if anything, you should be asking Branagh if he was at all influenced by me. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt he was, I have to say. No, it's, the thing about these stories is that they belong to everybody, and their charm is, is that they can be opened up to all sorts of different interpretations. Now, the Marvel comic Thor, I have to say, bears very little similarity to my Thor. Um, and their interpretation of the legends is very different. But that's fine, because actually these, these characters are so easily recognisable that it doesn't really matter what context you put them in. The way I wrote them, my characters have a human aspect, which is very apparent in the stories. They also have a godlike aspect, which you don't see much of because the gods in Rune Marks and Rune Light are no longer gods. They've been defeated and they've lost most of their powers. In the Marvel comics, they've still got pretty much all of their powers and some more special American ones made up for the, the purpose. Um, but they're still recognisable. Their, their essential heart is still there, which is, which is nice. And it's, I think, testimony to the endurance of these stories that that has happened. Yes, uh, Pantoufle in Chocolat is directly borrowed from my daughter, who for a long, long time had an imaginary rabbit of the same name. And so I borrowed him and put him into Chocolat. Um, and I then lent him to Hollywood on the understanding that nothing bad would happen to him. And they morphed him into a kangaroo, which was absolutely shocking. I mean, people talked to me about the priest and, and you know, what happened to the priest and why was he a mayor. But for me, the real deal breaker was the kangaroo. Because I had to take my daughter to see this movie. I was seven years old, and I did say to her, you know, I'm afraid Anushka Pontoufle has slightly been changed. And I did prime her for this. But when the kangaroo finally made its appearance, she stood up in front of the world's press and shouted, Look, it's not even a kangaroo, it's a wallaby! <laughs> kind of mystery parcel for me for a long, long time. And every time I unwrapped a lair and thought that I'd got to the heart of him, something else emerged and I found out that that was another lair of pretense. <laughs> and that actually, whatever was the truth of Blue Eyed Boy was, was somewhere deeper. At the end, I think I got to at least as close to him as, as anybody got. I have my own theory about what happens at the end of Blue Eyed Boy. I may be wrong. You see, I, I, had, I had my theories at the end of Chocolat about what might happen. Um, but I wasn't absolutely sure until I wrote Lollipop Shoes whether I had been right or not. I think if there is ever a sequel to Blue Eyed Boy, I'll be able to answer the question better. But so far, it's pretty much anyone's guess, and I like it that way. I like the fact that the reader has to work a little bit at that book and has to make their own decision. There are about four options that you can choose with at the end of that book. And really, I would say you should go with the one you feel instinctively most comfortable with, because they're all right on some level. Do we have some more questions? Everyone at the back is being very quiet. Oh, the gentleman, gentleman here. here. Would you think that your background in Barnes, and yours in general, has had an effect? Do I think my background in Barnsley and Yorkshire has had an effect? Yes, I think it has. I think inevitably it has. Um, a lot of people remember me for my 
books which are set in France, but that's really only about 50% of what I do. My other books are mostly set in a place not entirely unlike the place I live in. It's, it's been fictionalized. There are all sorts of, of things that have been moved around, but actually I tend to write about the places that I have an emotional connection with. And so some of my books are about Yorkshire, and some of them are about members of my family who are from Yorkshire. And so Blackberry Wine, for instance, is, is an example of a book which is mostly about my, my Yorkshire grandfather and, and his life, and, and that was very much inspired by him. <coughs> and I quite like going from one to the other because I'm equally fond of both. Too many people assume that too much of my work is entirely autobiographical. And if you read the hilarious Amazon reviews about Blue Eyed Boy, you'll see that some people are in genuine doubt and feel genuine concern for my <laughs> mental health. <laughs> And, and wonder what was wrong with me that I could create a character like Blue Eyed Boy um, and write this filthy, disgusting book without being Blue Eyed Boy and without being filthy and disgusting myself. The thing is, I think that the, the real, the core of this issue is not, it's not about it being about you necessarily, but about you understanding that character. And as such, I haven't written a character yet that I have entirely disliked. Thank you very much. It well. is entirely my pleasure. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Thank you to everyone at the Keys for making us such a wonderful dinner. Thank you for your questions, and thank you for buying the book. Oh, thank you all.